A specialist in Canadian publishing history, Janet B. Friskney served as associate editor to Volume 3 of the History of the Book in Canada and has published articles related to the Methodist Book and Publishing House of Toronto and the History of the Library and Publishing Services for the Blind in Canada. She has also edited and, and introduced 30 years of storytelling Selected short fiction by Ethelwyn Weatherold. Yes. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. So, perhaps you could just start by giving us a brief description of the New Canadian Library. So, the New Canadian Library, um, at least the period that I studied, began on January 17, 1958, and lasted until the early part. Of 1978 and that period was known as or I've, I've described it as the McClelland Ross year so Jack McClelland the publisher of McClelland and Stewart which was the home of the new Canadian Library and Malcolm Ross was the general editor of the series the whole idea itself came from Malcolm Ross and that dates back to the early 1950s the new Canadian Library itself was a Canadian literary reprint series that was designed to bring back into print um, and to have in print on an ongoing basis books, quality paperback editions, in fact, quality paperback pocket book editions. Used, not mass market, in other words. Not mass market, but yeah. quality paperback was a very different entity in the mid-20th century than the mass market paperback. Yeah. So the notion was to create this quality paperback series that could be used um, for students in the classroom, mostly at the post-secondary level, but there was an ambition as well to have some take up in high school classrooms in Canada, um, as well as to have some tra trade sales, in other words, sales through the general bookstores to people across. To the general public. To the general yeah. public, yes. Yeah. So yes, and we should, uh, we should quickly add that uh, the book we're talking about is the New Canadian Library, the Ross McClelland years 1952 to 1978 now it's interesting that it took so long you 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 take it back to 52 but uh that it took so long for uh for it to actually come to uh be why is that back in the early 1950s uh canadian literature was not a topic that was taught very much at Canadian universities or Canadian post-secondary institutions or in Canadian high schools. So the prospect of creating this series created a lot of anxiety and in fact Malcolm Ross who came up with the idea of the series, um, he was attentive to the fact that he was seeing uh, quality pocket books produced for American literature and those being picked up and being used in teaching. He had uh, a personal commitment to Canadian literature himself, although he wasn't trained as a Canadian literary specialist. He was a 17th century literary specialist, but he had this interest in Canadian literature. Somewhat patriotic, he, I guess. Right? Yes, he, yeah. he was a cultural nationalist. <laughs> yeah. So he came to the notion that there should be a, a, a series of Canadian literary reprints that would be available for the use in teaching. Um, and for research purposes to some, but primarily to bring, uh, Carl Klink had the expression of bringing books and students together. And by the 1950s, the teaching of literature in general was very much uh, text-based. The expectation was that you sh the students should be working with the books, not simply being told about books. Yeah, so, secondary sources. Or... Right. They should be working with primary sources. So all of that came into it. But still, it was the mid 20th century. There was very little uh, Canadian literature taught. Mostly when it was taught, it was part of what were called um, AMCAN courses, American and Canadian literature courses. They'd be dominated by American literature. The Canadian would tend to be more tacked on at the end, might not even be covered. So hence the anxiety. Malcolm Ross by 1952 has come up with the idea of the series and he initially approaches John Gray at Macmillan of Canada and apparently John Gray says, We'd lose our shirts, not interested. So, um, he's a Brit anyway. Yeah. Well, 
Um, but he had a long-standing commitment to sure. publishing uh, Canadian author titles in yes. Northern Canada. Yes. So it all it all boils down to risk because there's very small margins on quality paperbacks as well that are coming into those anxieties. So Malcolm Ross ponders the situation and then in uh, late in 1952, Jack McClelland, who is actually a former student of his, creates an opportunity by uh, when he sends Malcolm Ross a compliment on a recent book or article that uh, Ross had published. So Ross jumps on this opportunity, sends a note back in December 1952 saying, oh, thanks for that kind, those kind words. And then a postscript on the top of this letter, he scrawls, what about a Canadian literary reprint series? I'm paraphrasing, but that was... In did that. you see that letter? I did see that letter. And uh, I didn't initially find that letter. Um, a colleague, uh, Judy Donnelly, came across it when she was doing some other re uh, research in the McClellan and Stewart archives and passed that along to me. So I was delighted, and that pushed my, my original research. I had a time of 1953 to 1978 on this project, and that pushed things back. To 1952. Right, right. So serious conversations um, sort of commence around 1953-54 with McClellan and Stewart, but there's still there's market research, there's anxiety, um, and it just goes on and on through 53-54. By 55, there's a commitment in principle, but Jack McClellan's saying, you know, <laughs> there's not much money in this for anybody. We can offer you a little bit. It's a financial concern that's Absolutely. stopping this from happening, right? Absolutely, yeah. yes. By, by 1956-57, the commitment is there, um, and the final thing, the, the original four books in the series actually have a 1957 copyright date on them because that was the initial intention, but there's um, a problem with the engravings with the printer in the UK, and so that pushes the final launch date to 17 of January 1958. What's that problem with the engraving? Uh, it was just some problem um, with the engraving of the covers with the printers. I, I'm not sure of the specifics anymore. So, so it was you, due to come out at end of 50, 57? Yeah, the fall of 57 sometimes, and then there's this, this glitch um, okay. with uh, Hazel Watson and Viney, who were the original printers of the books yeah. in the UK. And that um, is that the only run that they did. The rest of them were done in Canada. No, or? anything that was done in the original white covers is Hazel Watson and Viney. And if you compare the the second um, cover uh, design that's adopted around 1970, um, that's when they switched to T H Best in Toronto to okay. do the to do the books. And if you compare the one book. Um, against another you'll see a slight size differential from the in in the volumes at that point as well as the change in cover design so the original covers were designed by frank newfeld the and, great frank newfeld yes and then the second covers which um uh, people were a lot less complimentary about they had the abstract design on them that um, was Fer Don Fernby, yes. Fernby, yeah. yes. Yeah, and that those covers come into play around 1970. And they're a bit more abstract, aren't they? They're very much more, yes. Yeah, because yeah. what Frank did was he he wanted to emphasize the identity of the author, so he, he stylized their drawings of them. Yes, he did. So the author's uh, portrait was appeared on the original uh, Frank Newfeld covers, and he he varied the level of representation or abstract the abstract quality of the covers based on the content of the book. So he was interpreting, using some interpretation of the covers based on what he was seeing in those books. Well, let's get to the criteria that Ross, or is there anything else that we should know about uh, leading up to the, the first printing? No other, I mean, it really was the, the that long, long journey towards the first issue, the first four titles, was really about a lot of financial anxiety and then some glitches over the printing and because they were being shipped from, yes. So okay, we can, okay. We covered it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because this very much is a book about, uh, about the reception mm -hmm. of, quote, great Canadian uh, works, 
both with the academic uh, community in hopes that these would be adopted for courses and just trying to get more Canadians to read and become familiar with Canadian literary heritage. Those were the two main audiences, right? And they were concerned about the reception of the, the books with those audiences. As a publishing historian, I would reframe it as the market. So the, the two main markets, they, the first market they envisioned for the series was the uh, post-secondary market with the, so the education market but with an emphasis on, on the post-secondary and mm-hmm. with, a, with a little hope of a little bit of hope of, of grabbing some from the high school market as well which fell in the elementary high school category in terms of the way publishing markets books the second market they hoped to tap was the trade book market and in fact over time they they do tap both markets but certain books appeal more to the ele- to the post-secondary market than they do necessarily to the trade market and, and vice versa. Yeah. Now, the way one word I would um, correct you on, if I may, is that word great. Yeah, no, I, I was, I was just using that as a, I know that he was using history and geography and yes. as, as, a, as a determinant and Canadianism versus, quote, great works and meritocratic works or... Yes. Right. So uh, one of the great anxieties um, that comes up with a study of the New Canadian Library or with any sort of probing around of the history of Canadian literature and the criticism of it in the mid-20th century is that you will find a lot of anxiety about the qualitative values of the works versus the worthiness of noting them based on what they tell about the story of the development of Canadian literature or what they reflect about the country. Someone like Malcolm Ross was always concerned to go for breadth and depth. I saw him use the word classic once in a, in, in a postscript, but in fact that's not a term that he would have ever been particularly comfortable with in terms of what he was trying to do with this series. He described things more of putting together as a cultural history of Canada through this collection and bringing back into print or maintaining in print a series of books that represented Canada geographically and his term was regional Mm -hmm. um, that was attentive to the different modes of writing that Canadian authors had engaged in over two centuries. This comes to a head at the Calgary conference which is which is how you end the book. Yes. So Maybe what I can do then is just look at uh, uh, some of his criteria to start with. Written by or set in Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked about aiming at a reading and an academic community. He's part of a highly committed coterie of uh, other academics who have his same ambitions. Yes, so I would put among that group um, sort of at the... He was slightly older, and at the head of the group was Carl Klink, um, who was based at Western. Other figures were Desmond Pacey, Ari Waters, Reginald Waters, uh, Claude Bissell at University of Toronto, Elizabeth Waterston, Clara Thomas. All of these uh, figures were overtly committed to Canadian literary studies um, uh, and in establishing it at the post secondary level in Canada. Mm. Now, Malcolm Ross. Um, at the beginning of his uh, career and when he becomes involved in the New Canadian Library, he's a bit of an outlier because he was really trained in 17th cent- as a 17th century literary specialist and that's where his initial academic work appears, but he had developed an interest in Canadian literature um, to some degree when he was a teenager. Um, and from a bit of exposure that he had when he was growing up as a schoolboy in New Brunswick. But also, he had worked for the National Film Board during the Second World War, and he had also been influenced by Donald Creighton's Commercial Empire of the St. Lawrence. He, he saw that as an important book. Did you work with John of, Grierson? The documentary? Yes, yes, he did. Yes, mm. there, there were two... There were two Grierson's in his life, John Grierson at the National Film Board that influenced him and also um, Herbert Grierson who wrote an important work of literary criticism that informed Ross's thinking because 
uh, Ross's interpretation was that Grierson was someone who looked at the whole culture in terms of looking at literature, and that's how he chose to approach Canadian literature. That's right. It's very much the whole, the whole series, isn't it? That, that yes. you have to take not just each individual title, but look at what they've done as a, as a project. Absolutely. So, um, because uh, I've always resisted um, people who, who talk about the new Canadian Library as of that area uh, era as the canon of Canadian literature, mm-hmm. because really, when you start to drill down into individual titles, some of those titles never had any canonical claims. However, if you look at the new Canadian Library at the macro level and see it as something that was trying to. Um, have a canonical impact in terms of creating a place for Canadian literary studies in the post-secondary academy in Canada. That's where its canonical significance was. So all of that group that we just discussed, as well as Malcolm Ross, were all um, very much determined to legitimize Canadian literary studies Mm -hmm. as, as something that's appropriate to approach. So we have a phenomenon that when the series is launched around 1958, there's only about 25% of um, English Canadian universities that teach a Canadian literature course, whereas by the early 1970s, we're up to 100%. Plus, we have the expansion um, of the universities through the late 1960s as well, so mm-hmm. that creates a Actually. significant number of the courses in real terms become much more st- substantial when you take that contextual factor into account as well. He also said, uh, or trying to convince Jack to go with this, he he uh, suggested that availability would create the market. Yes, because by the nineteen fifty two, um, for someone like Ross, as well as Clink and Pacey Waters, etc., they felt that more Canadian literature could be taught if the books themselves were the books, as in the teaching tools, were made available. So it becomes a bit of a, if you build it, they will come kind of expectation that that Ross sells to McClelland. And McClelland uh, chooses to accept the rationale because McClelland himself in that period was uh, shifting his own focus of his company more and more towards the publication of Canadian author titles. They've had a bit of a crisis in the late 40s with um, an agency that uh, they lost um, representing uh, being an agent for a foreign firm that had really um, emphasized how perilous the situation would be if you lost a major agency. Yeah. And Jack McClelland, who has now entered the business, makes a very self-conscious decision that going forward we're going to put more of our emphasis on Canadian author titles. So the new Canadian Library fits into Jack McClellan's broader vision for his company in the 1950s as well. Yeah. Yeah. So he really approached Jack McClellan at a very good time. And uh, Jack McClellan was also like half a generation younger than John Gray McMillan of Canada or Lauren Pierce at Ryerson Press. So he had this youth and energy that he brought to the series and he was very much involved as a major architect in the series through that mm-hmm. through that throughout that first period of the new Canadian Library, which was another reason why I subtitled the book The Ross and Clown Deers. I like how you uh, you sort of position this. You first you, you give a little bit of a history of uh, or or a summary of what book history is. Yes. So and I'll read that out. Book history is a field of study whose considerations encompass matters relating to the production, dissemination, and reception of books and print, the human agents involved in such processes, and the interactive relationship that exists between published materials and the wider social and cultural milieu of which they are part and parcel. And then I really like the fact that you go into a discussion of if not the history of series, you talk a bit about the traditions of series. Maybe you could address that. Okay. (laughs) If if not, then I'll just read out the four of them. There's these four traditions whose histories are strongly interlinked are 
the series, the reprint series, the paperback, and the quality paperback. Yes. There's two things going on, really, Nigel. Because I'm a publishing historian, or more broadly, a book historian, but I was dealing with a topic uh, that focused a Canadian literary reprint series. So there's there's um, a certain amount of uh, expectations of literary criticism that I found over the years coming my way. But of course, I, I've never positioned myself as a literary critic. So yeah. that was quite a deliberate act on my part to offer some understanding of what book history is and what its motivations are and then in terms of discussing the history of the series so the the concept of the series goes back two or three centuries now Mm -hmm. and leading up to the difference between the mass market paperbacks that are established through things like penguin books in in the uk and the pocket books in the u.s and establishing what the mass market paperback pocketbook was versus the quality pocketbook because the quality pocketbook was perceived to be aimed for sale through the trade books, booksellers, not through the mass market outlooks. Smaller print runs, which means higher price tags, right? So yeah. the smaller yeah. print run uh, leads better to higher books. unit costs. Yeah. Yes. Better and binding. Better binding. Yeah. Um, and the notion of longevity too. So yeah. whereas a mass market book might be produced in 25,000 copies, it might be produced only once. Whereas the expectation with a quality um, paperback during that time, say it was produced in four or 5,000, but the expectation is, is that you would set it up and, and you would go back to print again. Yeah. Uh, so it was a long, it would keep long-term making you money, investment. Wouldn't it? Yes, yeah. because you're effectively creating a backlist. Yeah, by and, the series. and you don't have to reset the whole thing and design no. it necessarily. No. You also uh, talk about the fact that the series have a common theme typically. Yes. Uh, usually with uniform binding, uh, uniformly priced, appearing under a general title. And a series format is a means of dispersing the risk of individual titles across a collection of books. Numbering titles can also facilitate the impulse to collect. Yes, <laughs> yes. So publish- publisher series are fundamentally a marketing strategy for publishers, and you should never forget that when looking at a series, or at least um, <laughs> a book historian or a published historian wouldn't wouldn't forget that it would always be sort of top of mind. No, no, I, I've gone nuts on a book uh, series called Britain in Pictures. Mm-hmm. So I've got like 110 out of 132, I think so far. Right. And were they all numbered? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So there's a psychological um, factor in the numbering. So the New Canadian Library during the Ross McClellan years is a numbered series, but when mm-hmm. David Staines took over and relaunched the series after 1988, I don't believe they had any numbers on the series anymore, and that created a situation where they could add and drop titles from the original incarnation of the series as well. That's a speculative statement, but I suspect that that was um, part of the motivation. You'd have to ask David. <laughs> okay. You then say that, in general, the strategies that distinguish the publisher's series support D.F. McKenzie's established point that form or format affects the meaning or sense of a text. I thought that was a huge, uh, a hugely uh, complicated little sentence there. Well, I mean, if you, because uh, series use, they adopt a common cover design so that they're visually recognizable. But how does that affect the meaning or sense? Well, it it affects the perception of the book or the book on the shelf. Um, One of the books in the New Canadian Library is Hugh McLennan's um, Barometer Rising. So the the NCL edition of Barometer Rising has an author's portrait of the white, the white background, and it all looks very seri- serious. But at the same, around the same time, there was a popular edition of Barometer Rising issued for the mass market, and it has um, a much more romance cover uh, type of title on it. So the perception of the book um, and what the contents might be can be very much affected by 
the cover design. So the moment you put um, a work of um, past Canadian writing into the new Canadian Library, there was an elevation of its status for that reason, and authors were... Um, the authors really wanted to authors, get their works into Authors the, liked it. Well, authors like to get into the New Canadian Land for two reasons. One, for status, yeah. and, and secondarily, because they were quality pocketbooks. So the price tag on them was higher, and, and, and so in that case, their royalty rate might be greater, or they, the royalties that generated them had the potential to be greater. Um, you put that at... Six and eight percent. If the six percent up to in, the first in in the later 10, years in the nineteen seventies, yeah. they have to come up with a more M and S has to come up with a more competitive rate. So they changed the. Um, it was would it be six percent on a higher value? So six percent on three dollars versus six percent on yeah right. So so money. that that made so you the author would have to uh, look at. The long term, longer term nature of an NCL publication, and okay. uh, the the pricing um, versus if they had a mass market opportunity, then it would be um, a larger print run, but it would probably be a more modest um, royalty on a more modest price, price. on the book. Yeah. Um, that said, Jack McClellan wasn't he didn't object to non exclusive arrangements if the author wanted. To to um, have a mass market book going at the same time as a as a quality yeah. pocket book in NCL. You mentioned uh, Robert Fair de Graff. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about him? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's too long ago. He's, uh, <laughs> he was uh, he was instrumental yeah, in, in the paperback paperbacks revolution. In, in, yes, yeah. yes, in, okay. in the U.S. But yeah, I, my. Sure, not a problem. Sorry. It was a long time ago. It yes. was, what, 2007 that it first came out? 2007 for the book, but the original research for the dissertation, out of which it emerges, was in the late 1990s. So yeah, it's, okay. It's, it's been a while. But this particular edition was published in 2015, right? The paperback, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the trade paperback version, yes. So, yeah. so the, the original hardback edition was produced in of New Canadian Library was produced in about 300 copies, and um, I, I was lucky enough, a, a few people, a few props put it on their courses, so I guess uh -huh. it got sold through, so U of T kindly, UTP did a, kindly did a paperback. Yeah, we, we touched on Canadian nationalism, you quote Paul Litt, mm -hmm. the critic, who, I think he's here, isn't yes, he? Yes, Carlton. Carlton, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He talks about Canadian, uh, cultural nationalism and the uh, fact that Canadian patriotism threatened critical standards. Yeah, so Litt talks about, to use his term, is liberal humanist nationalism. Um, Litt looked at specifically at the Massey Commission, so the Royal Commission on National Development and Arts, Letters and Sciences, which was um, issued in the early 1950s. And he talks about this brand of liberal humanist nationalism active in, in Canada among the cultural elite at the time as um, attention. So the liberal humanist component is a desire for high cultural enlightenment that speaks to individuality and good citizenship. At the same time, there was the nationalism component was more based around romantic nationalism that creates a, an environment in which there's a, a pull to towards to creativity that uh, gives rise to a sense of national identity. Mm. Um, and very much some of people like Malcolm Ross and, and those others we mentioned um, formed and Jack Hall, they formed culture part of a cultural elite and there was always a tension going on between a desire for merit versus yes, aesthetic exactly. merit versus a desire to um, acknowledge the literary accomplishments of the country. Yeah, like kind of progressing time. through a a development. Well that's right? the thing, that whole developmental model uh, yeah. comes up as part of the the romantic nationalist component of all of that. So there's this 
oh, is the sense right up until the 1950s and 60s, um, going, going back into the 19th century, that um, there would be people who studied uh, Canadian literary output and, and have, uh, would express some anxiety about it, but there'd always been this hope, well, it's on an, a trajectory of improvement. That's right. So um, for people like uh, Malcolm Ross or all the introducers of, of the volumes in the New Canadian Library, when you read those introductions, it's fascinating because a few of them will say this is a Canadian classic and be, be done with it. But many of them will say, okay, well, this, these are the strengths of this title, but mm -hmm. these are its shortcomings. And, and you would often, the shortcomings would be uh, around the literary merits of the work. So that, that tension was always there. They're kind of ambiguous, right, a bit to, well, about them. I would, yeah, I would, I would say there's a lot of ambivalence. So there's this, there's this strong commitment to study Canadian literature, to recognize it, to make it, um, acknowledge it as, as worthy of study in a post-secondary classroom. At the same time, there are these hesitations about its literary merits. It's really kind of crystallized for me when you look at Northrop Pride's conclusions to the 1965 Literary History of Canada versus the one in 1976. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. in, in 1965, he's saying, you know, we, we really have to take a really broad, sweeping approach to the Literary History of Canada, otherwise... We're very plucked little, alouette, didn't we, you yes, throw that yes, in there? Yes, the plucked alouette, so yeah. otherwise we'd have very, very little to discuss. And by 1976, his conclusion basically says, Canlit has arrived, right? Mm -hmm. So somewhere <laughs> between between those, so, and they they become really important bookends, I think. Now, and I was I always felt that Fry was a rather reluctant uh, critic of Canadian literature yeah. that he did it at a more of a sense of duty than uh, yes. any real passion for yeah. for Canadian literature, whereas. For people like Ross and Clink and Waters and Clara Thomas and Elizabeth Watterson, it was very much um, a passion for them. Yeah, I don't know exactly who said it, but uh, you, yeah, I like this little quote about the fact that irony is key to our identity because because of all these opposites and yes. this tension. That's and, that it's an, it, and it's an inescapable res irony is an inescapable response. Yes, so Malcolm Ross um, articulates that in, in the 1950s before the, the launch of the NCL. He edited two anthologies that were focused on concerns about Canadian culture in the 1950s. Mm. Those become really key to seeing, uh, getting a sense of his thinking um, yeah. at that time and, and what's informing him as he enters into the editing of the New Canadian Library series. In the 1950s, he was also the editor of Queen's Quarterly. Because that quarterly um, published both critical material as well as uh, original short fiction, mm -hmm. um, that put him in touch with the contemporary writing community, although he had taught people like Adele Wiseman and Margaret Lawrence when he was at the University of Manitoba as well. So all, mm -hmm. all of these play into what leads to Malcolm Law's thinking about the need for a series of Canadian literary reprint titles. And there's a range of literary modes, so yes. we're, we're looking at poems, collected poems and criticism and novels and... Yeah, so I'd say novels would predominate, be predominant in the series. There were quite a few uh, short story collections, some of them were original and some were reprints. There's one play. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Reenie? I uh, know, Damnation of Vancouver. Yeah. Who is it? Who? Um, Earl Burney's Damnation of Vancouver is okay, the one okay. play. Um, little, uh, little trivia there. <laughs> uh, there's um, works in translation of French Canadian literature. Yeah. Now, there were two original translations, but for the most part, um, for the series, but for the most part, Jack McClellan resisted that because of the expense involved. And those were also anomalous. They, they actually got some Canada Council funding to support those translations. Yeah, they didn't really get any Canada Council or government money for this series per se. I mean, they no. got block grants, I guess, at some point. Well, but. the block grants don't come into the world of Canadian publishing until the 1970s. So when the, when the Canada Council for the Arts was established in 1957 and continuing to the early 70s, they have what were perceived more as project grants. Um, so MS never approached 
Um, in the end, there was some speculation at one point, but in fact, they never approached the Canada Council for a block grant for the new Canadian Library. Why didn't they do that? Jack Malone decided they they didn't need to. So there was some uh, some discussion about it, and then Jack Malone retreated from it. He may have felt that some works in the series were doing sufficiently well to support the rest of the series. There was the discussion in the in the archives that I found, and then there was a retreat from it with no clarity about exactly why he decided not, not to. Two of the greatest uh, Canadian publishing enterprises, this mm -hmm. uh, new Canadian library and the Canadian Encyclopedia now, mm -hmm. they got Alberta money. Yes. But... Uh, well, that was political though, right? Yes. <laughs> but, but, but it is interesting, isn't it, that these are... These are held up as two monu monuments of Canadian publishing, mm -hmm. and there was no real support from the federal government. No, um, so the new, new Canadian Library might have benefited tangentially, tangentially yeah. in the mid-1970s when the block grant program did yeah. start up at the federal level, but um, it would have been part of a piece rather than anything overt. 23% female authors. Yes. Which isn't terrible given, no, uh, so, given the times. So this is one of the things. This, um, I, I saw no evidence in the archives that Ross was in any way uh, conscious, deliberately looking for women authors. Um, I never saw anything in the archives saying that he declined a female author because she was female either. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so there, there was that. Um, it would be interesting for a literary critic to come along and and take a look at what went in and the titles, the list of rejected titles, and, and make an assessment there if they wish to see um, whether they were. But I wasn't. I wasn't reading all of the books that were rejected, <laughs> were rejected from the series. I and there's about, like, he read about 700 altogether. Yes, he did. So yeah. in the end, there's about, the, the New Canadian Library had the main line, which had 100, over 150 titles in it, and then it had its or, or original, that's where the Poets of Canada ended up. So it was originally conceptualized as where original collections and materials would be put in, but in fact there was some a variation on that in the end. And then there was the Can Canadian Writers series, which is another sub-series that was looking at criticism. But Ross, his concerns were um, regional representation, um, looking at the development of Canadian literature across time. So all of those factors. But he, he was more inclusive than some um, other scholars of the day would have been had they been the general editor of the series, because he did not disdain literary modes of the 19th century. Where, so a lot of the Canadian literature, literary critical community in the 50s and 60s and 70s placed a, a high value on realism. And I think mm -hmm. the series would have been somewhat different if certain other individuals had taken it on, whereas Ross was very much interested in having some representation of modes of writing novels in particular that had occurred before. Yeah, he wanted to take different cultural moments on their on their own terms. Yes, right? and, and that again went back to um, looking at literature in the context in which it had emerged originally. That was a real critical concern Criteria. for him. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about the the jackets uh, and the fact that they're they're striking, and Frank Lou felt that it. it looked a very good job on them, but what Jack also wanted was, well, I guess point of sale yeah. was key for him, right? And I guess there were some posters done up. Yeah, so you're harkening back to the very launch of the series. Um, it takes them a while to come up with this, the first cover line, cover design, which is the one with the white background. And the this kind of torn the little strip along the left. The, the torn yeah. strip along the left and then a portrait of the author, yeah. um, which got became a bit tricky when they had authors who were published multiple times because they had to be a bit creative, otherwise people would have been confused by Stephen Leacock, for example, who had a lot of representation in the series. Um, but the point of sale factor, when when they were doing the figuring out the money, mm -hmm. the money <laughs> for the first four titles in the series, mm -hmm. uh, for that one they were planning 5,000 copies at 
a retail price of a dollar. And um, Jack McClellan's calculations at the time after, you know, everybody had been paid their royalties and all the production costs had been covered, if they sold all 5,000 copies of each title, then they would make about $100 on each title. So that's, that's how acute the risk was. And it mm -hmm. took um, several years to sell out th three of the four first titles in the series. So the point of sale business... To wind back to that, sure. yeah. Fine. <laughs> so the point of sales business was because they also wanted to market the books in the regular bookshops. So paperbacks of all kinds, the quality paperbacks um, in the sold in books bookstores, they required a cover that would draw attention, um, that would capture catch the eye of. The people in the bookstore simply because they couldn't uh, the publishers couldn't afford to do any advertising um in, yeah, in the it's media, different in its own media yeah. yes okay. i mean the new canadian library was um lucky in the sense that it did get some uh, reviews that's the other point the series context in which it was yeah issued originally so it was it was lucky in that sense Jack uh, decided to really push review copies. He did three hundred copies of each when it was launched. Yeah. When it was launched, yeah. so so yeah, I guess they got and the, and, the, and you say the response was was very favorable. Yes, in the, the late nineteen fifties, you have individuals among the book review community who also share that commitment to the promotion of Canadian writing. Mm -hmm. So they recognize what. Ross and McClelland are attempting to do, and they do their part in, in, in helping promote the series. Leacock outsold the others by a considerable margin, and as a result, he, uh, he, he, he makes an appearance quite frequently because he yes. just he makes money for them. So I would call uh, Leacock like a stabilizing factor. So there was a Leacock title in the first batch of four, and that one um, outsells the the others initially. Over time, something like uh, Sinclair Ross's As For Me and My House actually becomes a tremendous seller for the series. Um, That's really given high praise as a masterwork by many, isn't it? It is now. Back in, in 1958, yeah. um, it had had its day, hadn't done very well, and Sinclair Ross was really pleased when they, and touched, I think, when they put it into the New Canadian Library and gave it a second life. And then yeah. it became one of the most stalwart titles in the series over time. It sold over 100,000 copies by 1978. Wow. Yes, right? So, wow. so Leacock is interesting because in the early years, I would call him a stabilizing factor. So Leacock titles were regularly placed into what Ross called NCL batches for that stabilizing factor. Things like Sunshine Sketches and Arcadian Adventures would be picked up absolutely by the academic sector, the post-secondary market, but some of the other Leacock titles were very deliberately placed in the series to try and pick up more of a trade, mm -hmm. trade sales to help stabilize the series. Over time though, um, Sunshine Sketches among the Leacock titles, became the most prominent seller. Yeah. And over the course of the entire series, uh, the Leacock's claim to fame as a stabilizing factor becomes less of an issue in the 1970s when you start to have people like Margaret Lawrence and Margaret Atwood. Um, and Gabrielle Raw was an, an incredibly important author for, for the New Canadian Library in terms of generating, generating sales, I think. What are the first four titles, uh, by the way? Sinclair Ross's As For Me and My House, Morley Callahan, Such As My Beloved, Literary Lapses by Stephen Leacock, yeah. and Over Prairie Trails by Frederick Philip Grove. And so there, there's a picture of those four titles in, 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 the, the, book. in the book. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And there's a nice picture from a magazine um, of Jack McClellan with those four, two, four books displayed on his desk it's an early article about the series. Okay, so in 63, 50,000 were sold. 67, 96,000, by 71, 275,000. Yeah, those are cumul cumulative figures for the entire series. And you have to keep in mind that the series grows by more books year, year by year. Mm. And there's a great 
surge in publication. Um, right around Centennial, no? Like 67? No. For the first couple of years, they're issuing um, a couple of batches a year, and then they pull back a bit because um, the series hasn't taken hold yet. But if you consider this is a time when there's only about 25% of Canadian universities with English Canadian universities with Canlet courses. Yeah. Um, so they pull back a little bit in the early 1960s to one issue a year, and that's consistent for the remaining years, but they're not consistent about the number of titles in an issue. So sort of around 1973, 74, 75, McClellan and Stewart decides to have some paperback promotions. And at that point, especially the 74, 75, they published far more books um, in those years in the series than they had typically. In 72, you, there's this five-pack. Yes, the great Canadian five-pack promotion. It's like beer. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, um, these these particular promotions, the great Canadian five-pack in 72. I'd love to get, see four. what that looks like. Like well, what, what was it again? Was it like a, was it like a, a, a case of beer? Or? Oh, I, I never saw I don't know whether they were just bound or whether there was something. I mean, Jack Malone had done other things. Uh, the second batch he sent out in a Christmas, one of those net Christmas stockings. Oh, yeah. And uh, there was another batch in the 60s that he sent out wrapped in the measuring tape, saying a measure of reading tape, uh, reading pleasure on it. So yeah. he, did, he did things with the great Canadian five pack they did designated um, some thematic bundling of titles. I'd like some, to collect some, that stuff, yes. <laughs> but the problem is everyone threw it away. Yeah, It'd yeah. be hard to get that. I there, I, I didn't see anything in the main uh, part of the archives I was looking at, but it doesn't mean there might not be something in the promotional section of the archives that I never oh, came yeah. across, because the McClellan and Stewart archives is enormous. Right? Is it? So, yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Well, that's good. Okay, so Claire Pratt, tell me about Claire Pratt. So Claire Pratt was uh, the daughter of E.J. Pratt, the poet. And Claire Pratt uh, was a very important um, in-house editor at McClelland and Stewart. Mm -hmm. And she is the first in-house editor of the New Canadian Library series. And she works closely. Um, so Jack McClelland, we know as a key architect at McClellan Stewart working with Malcolm Ross, but then the day-to-day -day work on the series in-house was done by an in-house editor, so initially Claire Pratt. And she was very conscientious, particularly working on 19th century titles with people like Carl Klink, and she would go the extra mile. She would consult with how they wanted to manage the treatment of the text because for Clink working on something like Susanna Moody's Roughing Him in the Bush, he had the physical edition from the 20s that had been published by McClellan and Stewart, but he was going and looking at other editions of the work that were available at Western, and then he would consult with Pratt and they would come up with some... Hybrid? Well, it, the text that got annotated <laughs> would have been the McClellan and Stewart edition from the 1920s. So he would annotate, and then it would be sent off to Claire Pratt, and then she would be working with that, and if she had any questions, they'd go back to Clink. And that was true of other 19th century okay. titles, the, the history of Emily Montague as well. Okay. And Claire Pratt also, I mean, she contacted Sinclair Ross when As For Me and My House was going through the press and said, you know, I've, I've noticed a few oddities when I was looking at the work from the original edition is there are there weird sentences or yeah she had some questions about sentence structure and things so she she wrote to him and Sinclair Ross agreed to some and not to others and she mm. respected his choices mm -hmm. so one of the fascinations I think for New Canadian Library for someone who's working as a textual critic mm -hmm. if they are working on a book that was issued in the New Canadian Library while the author was still alive, I encourage them to go look at the NCL edition and to look in the archives to see whether there was inter any interaction between the um, author and McClellan and Stewart at that time to see whether there were textual changes that were instigated by the author. 
Yeah, there's there one were, book that was pretty well rewritten, wasn't it? Yeah, there? so that was Mead, was it? Mead, Edward Mead's Remember Me. That was um, issued during the war, um, the Second World War. The author was writing things, sending them back to his wife, who was writing them up, and then sending them to the original publisher. Faber, yeah. Yeah, so the book, the book came out at the time, and then when um, the notion of publishing it in the New Canadian Library came up, Mead had a, a, a look at it and consulted with McClellan and decided, you know, he would happily do some revisions. Yeah. And the revisions were significant. So the yeah. NCL edition is extraordinarily different from the original yeah. edition of that. One book that didn't make it in during Ross's time was uh, Beautiful Loser. Yes, indeed. So um, <laughs> I, I identify what I'd say were three crises in, in the relationship between, yeah. between Ross and McClellan over that that 25 years that they worked together on the new Canadian library and one of those crises was over beautiful losers so beautiful losers was a, an original hardback publication by McClelland and Stewart and just to add of course McClellan was good friends with yeah, Leonard McClellan. the book had done the, the normal process it had been issued in hardback there had been a uh, paperback edition with another house and then the rights for the um, short-term mass market paperback edition were coming up and an in-house editor alerts Jack McClellan to this so he raises the possibility of putting it in the new Canadian library with Malcolm Ross and mm -hmm. initially it looked all okay and then Ross sits down and has a series of read it read of it and decides no absolutely not in, he <laughs> and, says infantile pretentious obscenity for obscenity's sake. Yes, so Malcolm Ross felt quite strongly against Beautiful Losers. Jack McClellan was quite perturbed. He tried to convince Ross otherwise. Ross was unmoved and in the end uh, Jack McClellan respected Ross's veto. But it was the first title. The first book, yeah. So after <laughs> after um, after Ross's retirement as yeah. general editor in 1978, the series goes into a three-year hiatus while the MNS is deciding what to do, and then they they do a relaunch. They start adding titles again in 1981, and the first book they put in the series at that point is Beautiful Losers. The uh, he went after a lot of different uh, introducers. Yes geographically and institutionally in hopes of getting getting these books adopted uh, by Canadian uh, University uh, yeah, know, so, English so, Department. So the introductions were interesting. So um, the introductions distinguished the new Canadian Library from competitors that started to appear in um, from Oxford and Canada paperbacks and Ryerson and everything through the 1960s. So a distinguishing characteristic of the New Canadian Library was virtually all of them had an introduction added to the volume. Let me just read this out here. Mm -hmm. Our introductions are meant, this is Ross, mm -hmm. our introductions are meant to be interpretive and critical with emphasis on theme, structure, pattern of symbol, tone, etc with plot detail used only for necessary illustration. And if you think of the wording of that, that reflects Ross's concern that the introduction be of utility to people in the classroom. So yeah. of utility to the student who's reading the books, but also of utility to the professor in the classroom. Um, and, and in some cases, the, the introduction to the New Canadian Library edition of the book would be the only critical piece that's available to the professor when they were teaching these works. So they there's a highly differentiated uh, amount of criticism available about titles in the New Canadian Library from this era. As a component of the quality pocketbook series that Ross and McClellan envisioned, they also very deliberately wanted to have an introduction in there as another factor to set them apart Heart. from a mass market edition of the work. Then you later talk about allographic introductions. Yeah, so that that's the same. So the allographic is simply written by a party other than the author. Yeah, and you, you quote literary theory. Yes. <laughs> you do get a little heavy, which yeah. is good. <laughs> Uh, literary theorist uh, Gerard Genet, who uh, says they, that they work to, recom uh, to recommend a work, 
and to promote and guide its reading, to promote information about its uh, title's creation, publication, and situation within an author's oeuvre, and to offer some uh, biographical background about the author. But these ones, as you say, were kind of critically ambivalent. They, yes. So, so this which is, is great, like, I think. Well, it, I mean, the, and again, the, the critical ambivalence reflected the general critical ambivalence toward Canadian literary studies and e Canadian literary works in the mid, from the mid fifties right through to the seventies. And it was wonderful to read that theoretical piece by Jeanette because he he does say that the allographic introduction should be strongly in favor of the work being put forward. But for the new Canadian Library, that was certainly not always the case. And uh, in a couple occasions, people would be quite harsh, in fact, towards the work that they were introducing. So, But Jack's goal, though, simply was uh, that it would make at least enough money to, to keep the series going. Mm -hmm. And even despite that, he, he did publish quite a few that he didn't think were, would be commercially viable which speaks volumes about him. Yes. Jack McClellan was very conscientious, I think, about, particularly in the first dozen years of the series, 58 to the early 70s. He was very um, conscious of the fact that, and conscientious about it, that he was working with an English professor who had come to him with this idea of a series that a major market for the works would be the university classroom. So he relied on Ross as the authority about which books were significant mm -hmm. historically. And it was often, the, 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 not exclusively, because something like Ruffing in the Bush did quite well, and Jack McClellan totally acknowledged that, but um, he wasn't too excited about publishing Antoine, Antoinette de Mericourt's <laughs> book in the 1970s, but mm -hmm. he, he still did it. So yeah, yeah. I think the relationship between Ross and McClellan, or McClellan's relationship to Ross, was quite respectful. Um, even though uh, McClellan often had a lot of impatience with academics, but he was quite respectful of Ross and his ambitions for the series. They kind of cheerfully haggled over certain works. Um, DeMille's strange, strange manuscript in a copper cylinder is one they went back and forth on and went to external assess internal assessments and external assessments and finally it managed to get into the series uncut um, which because basically McClellan just said I'm, I'm tired of being nagged about it fine <laughs> we'll put it yeah. in you know and, and other titles in the series were, were doing splendidly so they, yeah. they couldn't complain about how many of Gabrielle Bra's titles were doing so yeah. But he did, I mean, his his sort of demand that there be page limitations, for example, or permissions that he had to get, that did have an, an impact on, on yes. content. And there was quite a controversy about abridgments, right? Yes, so a certain number of 19th century titles were abridged in the series. And the interesting thing about the controversy was it was more retrospective, right? So at the time... The people introducing the works, like uh, Carl Carl Clink was one of them. They Elizabeth Waterston. They were they were willing at the time to do that because they felt it was more important to get an edition of the work into the new Canadian Library, even if it was an abridged edition. So, by the nineteen seventies, after Canadian Literary Studies is more consolidated in the post secondary institution. There's a reflective look back at some of the titles in the New Canadian Library series, and there's criticism of those abridgments and the interpretation of the works that occurred based on abridged text. So there's a there's a genuine um, scholarly preoccupation with that, and yeah. and we should never not recognize the importance of that either. What I would say the only difficulty was is that the people making the criticism in the in the mid to late 1970s, early 80s, weren't necessarily reflecting on back on the circumstances of the 1950, late, late 1950s and early 1960s, mm. and the fact that this was a trade publisher that had taken it on, yeah. not a scholarly press. Right, and they had to fact, worry about profit. And the fact that these works were never envisioned as scholarly editions per se, they were envisioned as texts that could be used in the classroom.
So they wanted to aspire as far as the quality paperback, quality paperback pocketbook, in fact. But they weren't they weren't aspiring to scholarly editions at the time. And, and in fact, if you think a scholarly edition can take years to produce because of all the research involved, yeah. and you had a turnaround time on some of these books going into the series of less than 18 months, depending on you know where, where it came up in the queue and whether an introducer could be recruited and whether the rights were available. Yeah. So there's all of that. When it came to rights and permissions, that was a different factor. So there was permissions cost if you put together an anthology could be an issue. So there was um, a collection of essays about prose and poetry that was put together, I think, by A.G.N. Smith. The original notion was to have one volume, but when they examined the permissions costs, McClellan was like, okay, it's going to cost us too much to request permissions and pay permissions to other publishers, but the way we could manage this is to split this manuscript in half, and they did that, and they added a couple of other essays to the prose version, and that made the editor happy. And so McClellan was willing to work around those situations and look for ways to solve problems. Then there was the rights issue. So back in 1958, when the series was being conceptualized, Ross and McClellan both saw it as a Canadian literary reprint series. Full stop. They didn't see it as a Canadian literary reprint series, only of McClellan and Stewart titles, which was another distinguishing feature of the series. So they went out and they approached other houses like Macmillan of Canada and Clark Irwin and for a time were able to get paperback rights to put the works into the new Canadian Library. Over the course of the 1960s, um, those competing Canadian firms who didn't have any faith in quality paperback publishing, say in 1960 or the late 1950s, mm -hmm. all of a sudden seem, see that McClellan Stewart seems to be making a go of it with this new Canadian Library. Maybe we should do something comparable. And so they start to withhold rights because they decide to launch their own quality paperback series. And sometimes those those quality paperback series tend to, to mix um, fiction and nonfiction, and uh, most of them didn't have introductions to them. Mm -hmm. But the impact for New Canadian Library was all of a sudden where they used to be able to get rights from certain publishers, those rights were now being denied, or in the case of something like Hugh McLennan's Each Man's Son, it was originally in the New Canadian Library, and then Macmillan of Canada, when it decides to launch the Laurentian Library series, no longer gives permission for reprinting in the New Canadian Library, so that mm -hmm. all makes an impact. Yeah, I mean, if you want a scholarly edition or series, uh, that's something that the U of T should, should mm -hmm. take on, or... Or, or that, I mean, that press was well-funded back then, I think. It, would, it was doing quite well, but maybe it just didn't well, see the need. Or The University of Toronto Press does start a reprint series in the early 1970s, but it doesn't do very well. By, I think it's in the 1990s, um, here at Carleton, the Centre for Early for the Editing of Early Canadian Texts is set up, and it does a number of pre-1900 works as scholarly editions, and there's grant money involved. Yeah. And they contain a more substantial criticism in the, in the book, right? Well, it's a, a scholarly edition would have looked at all of the iterations of a work that had emerged and make a decision about what is the authoritative text based on a date of publication, and then worked with that text to be the primary text, um, and then built a whole apparatus around it. It's a major scholarly yeah. endeavor. Long term, a scholarly too, edition. for each, yeah. each work. It requires money and labor, um, yeah. the kind that certainly was never associated with putting together a volume for the new Canadian Library. But again, you're looking at the consolidation of Canadian literary studies, right? So in 1950s and 60s, nobody really would have conceived of scholarly editions of Canadian literary texts because the whole the legitimacy of the field itself and the study of Canlet was still being established. Yeah, and in fact, that's what you say. You say that, using the word consolidated, you... You say that the new Canadian Library consolidated the reputations of many of the authors, but didn't really establish any. It depends. It depends on when. The new Canadian Library is interesting because it takes in 
works from quite a, a breadth of time, right? So if you're dealing with works that were published before 1900, well, in the 1920s, there was a whole series of um, surveys of Canadian literature that were produced. There were about five surveys at that time. So those authors would have thought about and discussed many 19th century works. So what you find is that a number of pre-1900 works that were put into the new Canadian Library during the Ross and Clone years had previously been discussed <laughs> and might have appeared in multiple editions, things like The Backwoods of Canada by Catherine Parkville and Susanna Moody's Ruffing in the Bush. There may have been multiple editions of those works over time. There's um, some criticism. So being placed in the new Canadian Library was really further consolidation of a reputation that had already been established. For someone like Sinclair Ross, and as yeah. for me in my house... Kind of a rebirth, wasn't it? It, it was, right? So the book hadn't done particularly well in its original publication. Being placed in the series is, was highly significant, and most of the criticism about the work appears after, after. its appearance and its take-up by the Can Canadian Academy. Those are the, the sensitivities that... I, I think are important in in looking at the series. I, I one of the things that I did in writing the last chapter was to go and look up uh, what scholarly criticism exists on, on every author. <laughs> well, yes, and you make that point. So, you say that that that's a that's a published criticism is a sign of uh, the canonical, and mm -hmm. a lot of them fail the test, right? Yes, that's yeah. correct. And uh, even by the time I was doing the studies, a uh, study of the New Canadian Library, so I was doing my most of my research for this book in the late '90s. And by that time, many of the authors and works in the series were not being discussed in the classroom, right? So yeah. at that point, so Margaret Lawrence and Margaret Atwood, absolutely, Gabrielle Raw, yes, they were all still. There, but there were other authors um, that Henry Kreisel, that's not somebody I ever came across by the time I was going through post secondary education, right? And then there were there were individuals, um, authors, or books that were never in the New Canadian Library of the 58 to 78 period, like Alice Munro's Lives of Girls and Women, or Hugh McLennan's Two Solitudes, or W.O. Mitchell's works. Um, the rights were held by other publishers who refused to allow them for the series. So that created a situation for the, the professor in the classroom who was choosing books for their courses in, in the 60s and 70s if, if they wanted to do what they felt were important works of Canadian literature at that time, they might well need to be drawing on you know, works from Macmillan of Canada's Laurentian Library alongside works for the in the New Canadian Library. Now, mm -hmm. there's no doubt that the New Canadian Library was dominant because it started earlier, and McClellan and Stewart had its own tremendous backlist on mm -hmm. which to draw, and that backlist, the McClellan and Stewart backlist, became more dominant in the 1970s because of the rights issues. But at the same time, <laughs> um, there were a sufficient number of books that would have been deemed important works of Canadian literature in the 60s and 70s that were never in the new Canadian library during the Ross and Cullen era. One of the things about academics is they shy away from evaluative criticism, which always bugged me. <laughs> uh, because I think that's where much of, sort of canon building takes place, is the cut and thrust and argument about what, what's better and why. and. Um, and sure, it may be subjective, but, uh, but that's where some of the best arguments come from, I think. But, and I think Jack thought that too. But maybe you could tell me, because this comes to a head in the, in, at the end of your book in the, in the uh, Calgary Conference of 1978. Yes, so by sometime in 1976, McClelland has come to the conclusion that it's time to retire Malcolm Ross is the general editor of the New Canadian Library to shut down the series, which happens in January of 1978, and to do some rethinking. The New Canadian Library as a property had become quite unwieldy at that point. It was comprised of over 180 titles across the main series and its two sub-series. So as a publishing property, 
it was a bit awkward. And some of the books, of course, as we know, weren't selling as well as some of the others. So I think McClung wanted to take an opportunity to really figure out how to revise and rethink what they'd done and probably do some kind of a, a relaunch of a more restricted series or under a slightly different title. I think he used the word classics, classics yeah. right? So yeah. you can never forget that Jack McClellan was a publisher and a bit of a showman and into Razzle Dazzle. Malcolm Ross was not into Razzle Dazzle. <laughs> he was very serious. Uh, right? Yeah, he was a professor, so, so he, got a, he got an income. Yes, and he had to he had relationships with with scholars. So you have the situation where McClellan has ambitions uh, to come away with what he would have thought is a more definitive list of titles from the existing New Canadian Library, and to move ahead with with that. But he needed a way to frame it, so he involves Malcolm Ross initially in some consultations with colleagues. The whole thing over time blows up into what became the Calgary Conference on the Canadian Novel, which becomes in part a retirement party for Malcolm Ross, probably the worst one <laughs> we can ever experience. And what McClellan had initially been concerned about narrowing the list of the new Canadian Library um, I think there were some funders involved in the Calgary Conference that weren't interested in only funding things related to one publisher. Yeah. So then yeah. the vision becomes expanded and then it becomes something like the 100 most significant Canadian novels and there are ballots sent out in advance of the conference and discussing those ballots all becomes part of the process and um, this creates some uh, anxiety among the Canadian academic community. Malcolm Ross takes a lot of flack for this. Um, these people he's built up relationships with over the years, all of a sudden he felt kind of turned on by them. By individuals, the ballot takes up a major um, point of discussion at the conference. Um, so ballots were sent out with, I think it was several hundred potential titles on it. And you know, offer some rankings, choose a hundred kind of thing was the imperative. Uh, the list is in available in um, a published conference proceedings from the Calgary Conference. If someone wishes to consult, oh, it. good. Yes. Where's that? Uh, you can get a copy here. Online. It was, it was. I don't. It wouldn't be online, but it was edited by Charles Steele post conference, so the list okay. is actually available. So. For McClellan, the, the Calgary Conference was actually quite successful because he leaves at the end of the day with a list of 100 titles and most of them, um, something like 78, I can't remember exactly now, were yeah. actually in the existing New Canadian Library, so he considers it a win. Malcolm Ross, who I think was traumatized by the whole experience, and, and even you know, when I interviewed him in the 90s, really you could see that he was upset, um, still 20 years on, about what... He was upset with Jack or with the other academics? Or I think what? he was just, he was upset with the whole experience because, um, I mean, he was very invested in Canadian literature and he had worked with, uh, on the new Canadian library in a very cons consultative fashion, inquiring of colleagues about books that they might want in the series, um, yeah. involving them in introductions and everything. He had never articulated the desire to create a canon. You know, yeah, it was a much more greatest hits. It, it was much more of a baggy. And when he started with the whole process back in the nineteen fifties, in fact, he didn't have a really strong knowledge base of Canadian literature. He had the will, but he didn't really have a, the depth of knowledge there yet of the whole field. And he relied a lot on colleagues and consultation. So for him, I think it was a very harsh way to end what had otherwise been a fairly positive 25 years experience with McClelland and Stewart. Jack McClelland involves him in another initiative post-conference, but still it upsets the relationship and it, it, it created a crisis. I'm kind of rambling now. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, no, no, but uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so he was upset so, and... But, right. the, but Jack got what he, well, you know, the interesting thing well, is he, you put, you... He did and he didn't. So he got, he came out with a list, so in the short term it was a win for him, but there was so much flack about it from people like Margaret Lawrence that he wasn't actually able to use the list. 
to in a, in to a go way forward. that he wanted to. And at that point, that hundred works would have really involved other publishers too, which might not have been a realistic thing to achieve yeah. unless multiple publishers were willing to come together. Together, and, yeah. yeah. But you do say uh, toward the very end, you say that. Uh, what Jack really wanted was an alternative to the list that Margaret Atwood put together in Survival. Oh, yes. That, so that's a wonderful revelation of the archives where Jack McClellan makes a reference to Margaret Atwood's Survival, which had been picked up as a major teaching text. Mm -hmm. But she never put it up as a canon or anything. She just was describing a, a, th a theory that she had about Canadian literature, and these, these, uh, these were the proof. Well, I think Jack McClellan's objection to the work was the fact that it, it was created as a teacher's manual, in effect, and it was used it as was such. It was adopted that it way. It was adopted yeah. that way. Yeah. So he felt the interpretation and the way it was being used was imposing limits on Canadian literature. Like mm. that's, But mm. that was a surprise moment for me. Um, Malcolm Ross didn't particularly like survival as a work either. He, he criticized it when it was originally published too. Mm. Jack McClellan was always interesting because he had, um, although he, he worked obviously fairly successfully with Malcolm Ross for a quarter century at the same time, he had um, a lot of misgivings and impatience with um, university professors at times and that really came to the fore when he was talking about the Calgary conference, I think mean, he writes in frustration to Margaret Lawrence, what's wrong with a list? We make lists all the time. And he, he was correct. Professors are making judgments all the time about certain mm -hmm. books and when they make choices and, and put them on their courses. But at the same time, I guess, choosing 100 books overtly was yeah. a very blunt yes. instrument in comparison to the subtleties that go on um, of choices year, year over year. So. Well, W.J. Keith said that uh, the New Canadian Library was uh, uh, McClellan and Stewart's greatest achievement, and Margaret Lawrence said it is one of the most valuable and significant, far-reaching, she called it an event, events in our literary history. I guess you'd agree with that, wouldn't you? I, I think it was uh, highly significant um, for its time period. It was one of the a key initiative, but not the un only initiative um, that worked towards the legitimizing of Canadian literary studies in the middle decades of the 20th century. But there were initiatives like Clinks and Waters Canadian Anthology, which was published before the new Canadian Library titles started to come out. There's Literary History of Canada, published in 1965 that Kling starts to work on a number of years prior to that. So there was really, um, I think you should see it, the new Canadian Library is one initiative among several mm -hmm. that occurred between the 50s and the 70s that really worked to legitimize and create a place for the study of Canadian literary works that we no longer had to apologize for. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, where are we today then? Can, can, you're saying that uh, we went from 25% to 100% mm -hmm. in terms of programs that, uh, or courses that taught Canadian literature in Canadian universities across the country. Where are we today and what's happening with the library now? So, where we are today, I can't say for certain because I haven't gone back and looked at university calendars in recent years. Um, I would imagine there's still a Canadian literature course being taught uh, in English departments at every Anglophone Canadian university, where I think it would become interesting to see where the focus of those courses are um, and how much material is being taught that comes from me before 1980. I think it would be fascinating to see um, someone do a study of the Canadian literature, especially the survey courses, and, and see where the focus is. Because for me, um, just anecdotally, it, it feels like someone like Margaret Lawrence, who was so prominent in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that she doesn't seem to have the, the same kind of prominence anymore. I don't know to what degree she may or may be taught anymore. I'm not a teacher in no. Canadian literature, so I, I, I don't have a sense of that, but I think it would be a very interesting thing to study what's happening 
uh, to do a comparison. Yeah, of, um, with 80, 1980 is the cutoff. Uh, yeah, well, 1980 in terms of the, the time of original publication of the works, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Especially because with New Canadian Library, the original iteration of it, by 1978, you might have had works published as late as 1975 in the series, but of course, it, I think it would be interesting to see how many works that were in the original iteration of the New Canadian Library, in fact, are still being taught or considered or in print today. So, and and now that the Canadian, the New Canadian Library is owned by a German company. There's been multiple phases of the New Canadian Library. Was there was the original period from 1958 to 1978. There was a three-year hiatus. Then from 1981 to 87, um, it's still McClellan and Stewart. The original version of it still exists, um, and works are just added. To to the existing series. In 1988, after Abby Bennett purchases McClellan and Stewart, the, the new Canadian Library is relaunched in beautiful four-color covers. Um, David Staines is recruited to be the general editor, and um, he works with an, an editorial board. I that included uh, Alice Monroe. Yes, point, yeah. yes it did. And my sense, I did talk to David back in the 90s briefly about the new Canadian Library, and I, I think if I'm recalling now, um, I think it was much more they sorted out the books and then they went to the publisher. And during the um, the Staines period of the new Canadian Library, there was um, decisions to go to complete texts um, of books yeah. like Roughing in the Bush. So that was the significant yeah. change in that era. Um, there was also something like I think it was uh, changes of. One of Ethel Wilson's works, the version that she preferred, there was an American version and a UK version, so the original NCL had the UK version and she preferred the American one that had a couple more chapters. So I think Staines recognized that and, and, and made those changes. So What about now? Like what's going on? Now, so it was interesting, a couple of years ago, um, Brian Busby uh, published something in Canadian Notes and Queries okay, about so he had been on the... Was it Penguin Random House? Everybody That's what it was. The, yeah. 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 So he had been on the Penguin Random House website, website which yeah. was now the owners of the New Canadian Library imprint, and found books that were not <laughs> Canadian texts represented there. And then uh, I think his article said he'd subsequently gone and found just a blank page. That made me curious. And, and one of the things I did preparatory to talking to you was to go to the Penguin Random House webpage and put in New Canadian Library. And lo and behold, I did find a New Canadian Library page. It currently has um, some of the titles in new covers and some of the older works in prior covers. So there's probably been about like six different cover designs for New Canadian Library at this point. But there was only a very limited number of works there. Like what, 10 or 20? I think there was about 40. Okay. 40 came up. Um, and there were works like Wakusta and um, Selection. So 40 out of 180. Well, like again, you can't even, um, the new Canadian Library under David Staines had transformed things. So that, yeah. was, uh, that was a series that contained some things that were in the original new Canadian Library, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. And Staines and his editorial board added yeah. later things. So yeah. I think it would be more of an issue at this point of comparing what David Staines had compiled during his era with what might be available on the Penguin Random House at this point. But there's no mention of a general editor. Um, I don't know whether any of the more current works include introductions. I think one of the titles I clicked on said it would, had been produced in a hardback edition, which would be an anomaly for the whole original concept of the new Canadian Library. Mm -hmm. So at present, it seems to sort of exist but maybe not in a, a way that is being managed in any conscientious fashion. So it will be in interesting to see whether there's a decision to, you know, maybe bring a scholar back into the mix to show some leadership or whether that's simply not part of the, 
the vision of the current publisher. I don't know. Jack wouldn't approve. Malcolm certainly would. Jack wouldn't approve. Malcolm wouldn't approve. No, absolutely not. I think they'd be saddened to see what's happened to the series. Yeah. Well, let's hope they uh, <laughs> let's hope they revive it. Yes. Uh, which is what we've been trying to do here uh, to some extent. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk about NCL. I've been speaking with uh, Janet Friskney, who is the author of it. New Canadian Library, the Ross McClelland Years, 1952 to 1978, published by the University of Toronto Press. What are you doing now? For my livelihood, I work in research administration, but uh, I continue to do research on the side. I'm working with some colleagues at Ryerson on an online exhibit around the Ryerson, sorry, the McGraw-Hill Ryerson Press Collection. Oh, uh, yes. Which is the... That just went to the university, right? It went to Ryerson Library mm -hmm. um, about two or three years ago, and it is the collection of titles that used to line the boardroom at McGraw-Hill Ryerson, which was inherited um, at the time of the merger in 1970 between McGraw-Hill Company of Canada and Ryerson Press. And when's that exhibition coming well, out? Well, it's an online, exhi online exhibit, oh, okay. um, and it's being designed to draw on existing secondary resource material to highlight um, works that are, are in this collection, so it's very exciting. Great. So what's the website? You know, just Ryerson Library? Uh, the website is private still. We have private? Okay. It's private, but You're not going to give us a scoop? Be, no, no. It, okay. it's, still, it's, still, it's, it's still a work in pro progress. Okay. But okay. Um, um, we're, we're planning a launch uh, because 2019 will be the 100th anniversary of the adoption of the Ryerson Press imprint by the Methodist Book and Publishing House for its trade book arm. Oh, so that's the relationship there. Very good. Well, thank you very much and good luck with that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.